Hello, welcome to UACNJ, United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. We're an umbrella organization for many of the amateur astronomy clubs in New Jersey at our dark sky site at uh, Jenny Jump. Uh, welcome you to uh, this PowerPoint presentation and uh, you can access us at the um, uh, URL down below there, www.uacnj.org. We also have a site on our website that gives information about astronomy for kids. You might find that interesting. And uh, I'm the one presenting it, Carl J. Harico. Welcome you here. And uh, I belong to the National Space Society. You can join as well in the future if you'd like to. Access them in terms of www.nss.org. Uh, and or you can join uh, a chapter I began here in New Jersey called the Space and Astronomy Society of Northwest Jersey. And you can see that over here on the right hand side and uh, you can access us through Facebook or by accessing the National Space Society. Ad Astra to the stars. The presentation is called Sky Watchers which is called archaeoastronomy but we'll go beyond that. We'll go beyond the prehistory of astronomy there's some interesting things to speak about there as well in terms of civilizations like uh, our Native Americans and the Incas, the Mayans, civilizations like that. As you look at this picture, though, you can see a very iconic image. And that iconic image is the image of, as you may have guessed, Stonehenge. Now, there's a variety of different types of astronomical tools that are used, that have been used in different kind of cultures uh, in looking at the sky, recording it, and so forth. You can see here those that are have been used by the Aztecs and by the Mayans and Stonehenge, of course, and the Chinese. Uh, these early civilizations, then, uh, used uh, various kinds of devices. Uh, it doesn't say it here, but they used, for example, natural devices like mountains, notches in mountains to mark things in the sky to locate it by alignment, uh, and also artificial kinds of buildings and structures of that nature. Uh, and they did it for mostly for harvesting and planting for survival purposes. <clears throat> and they tried to predict the future as well through the practice of astrology, which was the beginning of astronomy, by the way. It led to astronomy. And uh, they used it to align their cities, to structure their cities, various celestial objects in the sky, uh, also for timekeeping. So for a variety of reasons. Uh, they also incorporated it as part of their religion, which is interesting, and also for navigation purposes. So as they looked at the sky, they saw a myriad display of stars. But, you know, the brain tries to make sense out of things that it sees. And so they began to see patterns in the sky, representing various things in their culture. And as a result, they saw animals, heroes, gods in the sky, it, 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 all kinds of shapes in terms of these patterns of stars. And they named them, of course. And it became part of their culture, part of their religion, because this was heaven for them as well. Don't forget that. They also organized them into spotting different uh, patterns or constellations, different months of the year, making up what we now call a zodiac. Now, the idea being that uh, there has been this observation of the sky coming up with constellations, but the oldest happens to be 
the Big Bear. It's been around for 12,000 years. They've been calling this bear the Big Bear, interestingly enough. If you look toward the back of the Big Bear, you can see its hind end is in the shape of a kind of a dipper. The Big Dipper. That's where the Big Dipper is located, in the hind end of the Big Bear or Ursa Major. Now, if you look at the sky at Ursa Major, you'll see that it moves around the North Star. All stars appear to revolve around the North Star because the Earth is rotating on an axis, and the axis points to the North Star. So it looks like the stars are circling around the North Star. And so if you look at Ursa Major, Moving around the North Star, it changes its position every hour, and it changes its position every month. So it can be used as a clock for time. And here it is, as it's seen in the sky, diagram showing it at different seasons of the year. It's in a different position for each season. So you can tell what season you're in if you're not aware by looking up at the sky and uh, finding the Big Dipper and locating its position. Now the Big Dipper also can be used to spot the North Star. You can use the two stars in the outer bowl of the Big Dipper as a pointer. And if you follow that pointer, you'll come to the next bright star in the sky which happens to be the North Star, which is not a very bright star in the sky, by the way, but it's the brightest star in that area and happens to be in the handle of the Small Dipper, or Ursa Minor. Now, the North Star does not appear to move in the sky because our axis is pointed at it. It does have a slight variation in time, uh, a slight motion, uh, a fraction of a degree, uh, but for all purposes, all practical purposes, it appears to be uh, a star that stays in one spot in the sky while the other ones circle around it. Now, this for the ancients meant it was a special star. So it was a star that they observed in the sky, and some thought that it might be the center of their heaven because it didn't move. Now, other things were spotted in the sky, too. The ancients spotted various kinds of patterns of stars forming constellations, like the Big Bear, for example, and also something like a pattern forming what we now call Orion the Hunter. Had a prominent uh, display of three stars making the belt. And if you follow the belt left to the left in this diagram, you'll see that it leads to Sirius which is a very bright star. As a matter of fact, the brightest star in the winter sky, and it represents uh, some kind of figure for various kinds of cultures. And you'll find out in a moment what figures it might represent. And in the right picture here, you see the three stars in the belt very much enlarged. So Orion was used then as one of the constellations to spot in the sky. Also, the Pleiades, seven sisters, although sometimes you can see eight, at least it was seen that way by the ancients in the past, uh, but one star grew, I guess it, it grew dimmer as time passed by. So the Pleiades seem to be a very prominent grouping of stars, uh, happens to be a cluster of stars in the sky, used by the ancient people in order to align on uh, in some cases, to organize and create the streets of a city, the Pleiades. The moon, of course, is a prominent object, and as they viewed the moon, they could imagine all kinds of things, uh, men in the moon, a woman in the moon, and uh, some did imagine a woman in the moon, and uh, one was called Luna, that's where our word lunar comes from in terms of the moon.
And also the moon was observed in terms of looking at the phases of the moon. And uh, one story goes that uh, uh, the moon began thin, but then it began to eat more and more. And as it did so, it became fatter and fatter until finally it really became the full moon, the fat moon. Uh, but then it stopped eating for some reason. Uh, it began to lose weight and it died and became again the new moon by arising once more. And that's how it was explained in terms of why the moon goes through phases. The sun, of course, is another object in the sky that was viewed as a very prominent object. Of course, it allows plants to grow. It gives us heat. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, it was looked upon as being a god as well. Uh, here's an image on the right of Ra, one of the gods uh, that uh, were, was looked at by uh, the Egyptian culture. And... Uh, the ancients looked at the planets as well. They could see five visible objects in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the five visible planets, beginning here, lower right, going up to left, Mercury, Venus, and uh, out of order, Saturn, after Saturn, Mars, and then Jupiter, the five planets that were visible in the sky, plus the two other celestial objects, sun and moon. Very important. Here it is, the sun and moon. Eclipses of the sun and moon are very important events for the ancient people. As they looked at it, those people who were able to predict when these would happen were people that were looked upon as being very powerful because they could predict what would happen to this God in the sky, how it would disappear, uh, almost as if some demon gobbled it up, like, for example, the eclipse of the sun. Also, the solstices and equinoxes were very important to observe in the sky. And as you can see here, you could probably guess, we're looking at uh, the solstice as it's seen through the stones of Stonehenge. And uh, also, uh, the shadow of the sun enabled the ancients to tell time by making sundials or to look at various objects, tall objects like obelisks, and following the shadow. And as the shadow moved, you could indicate the time or find out the time or set the time. Also, what was done is that if you observed a star setting with the sun disappearing as the sun disappears in the sky, it was called a heliacal setting of that star. And if it rose in the morning with the sun, it was called heliacal rising. Helios meaning sun. So heliacal rising of various kinds of uh, stars or star clusters like the Pleiades were very important kinds of events for the ancients to mark in the sky and to use as a calendar system as well. Uh, here we have, uh, oh, about 5,000 BC, the construction of what we now call Stonehenge. It wasn't built in one year or even a hundred years. It was built over a series of a hundred years, over a series of centuries. Uh, a beginning, uh, maybe even short of 5000 BC, for various kinds of purposes. Uh, all these structures that were built by the ancients were built not only for the purpose of observing what's in, in the sky by alignment, but also to serve as a religious uh, uh, ritualistic structures uh, and other kinds of sacrificial areas and things of that nature, mostly for ceremonies, rituals, things of that sort. Here's a, an aerial view of Stonehenge. 
showing how the stones were set up. And around you can see a ditch that was set up. It probably it was the first thing constructed. Uh, it had holes in it, and uh, it was believed that these these uh, ancient sky watchers at that time moved stones from hole to hole, marking eclipses. And as a result, they then began to gather information that helped them to predict eclipses of the sun, for example. On the right would be a diagram showing uh, a, uh, uh, a walkway, a pathway to the center of the Stonehenge complex of stones, some of which were carried from Wales somehow or other all the way to Stonehenge, some weighing uh, several hundred tons. So it was used then as uh, a kind of an observatory, I guess you could say an observatory, and also a ceremonial place for holding rituals. Here's an, uh, a diagram showing how the stones of Stonehenge were lined up in order to predict the summer solstice, sunrise, sunset, the winter solstice, sunrise, sunset, and the rising and setting in the winter and summer of the moon. So it was used for alignment, we know that. It also has been said by some archaeoastronomers that it was used as a kind of computer to, to compute the uh, uh, time line of different kinds of events like eclipses and things of that nature. Now, one of the major cultures that gave us a lot of information about celestial bodies, how they moved in terms of uh, the motion in the sky, recording it very precisely and things of that nature, would be the Mesopotamian culture located between the Tigris and Euphrates in the Middle East and uh, in a place, an area called the Fertile Crescent. And it consisted of various cultures like, for example, the Sumerian culture, the Babylonian uh, culture, the Akkadian, the Syrian, and uh, the uh, Chaldean cultures, all making up the Mesopotamian civilization. On the left, you can see image, the drawing of how it may have looked at that time. And in the background, you see a tall tower. Now, that's probably the basis for the story of the Tower of Babylon, for example. Uh, and uh, the, the tower probably served as an observatory where there were different levels and uh, mostly there were seven levels built in these tower type structures at this time in history and that seemed to represent the seven visible prominent celestial objects in the sky sun, moon and the five visible planets uh, also, seven days of the week, for example, that does the same thing. On the right would be an image depicting what the people might have looked at, uh, uh, looked uh, at that time. Now, here's a structure called a ziggurat. That's a common structure in the Mesopotamian civilization. And again, seven layers making up the tower, seven visible celestial objects. And uh, it was used probably as an observatory as well, uh, a multi-purpose structure just like Stonehenge and served the purpose of uh, ritualistic kind of celebrations and uh, attached to religion and otherwise. Now the Sumerians were a very important culture making up the Mesopotamia civilization. And uh, they came up with uh, the number 60 as being important in terms of the base 60, using it to make uh, a measurement of time, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, which we still use today. Also, they used the 60 for devising measurement of a circle 360 degrees in a circle. Now, 
is an interesting kind of an artifact that uh, was dated back to 3,000 years ago. And uh, it was found in Germany, called uh, a place called Nebra in Germany. And uh, it's a bronze sky disc uh, that has some gold inlaid representing various kinds of stars in the sky. The Pleiades, for example, uh, is represented, it seems here, and also the moon and the sun. So he was a kind of uh, an ancient planisphere that was made these many years ago. Next civilization would be the, between Pakistan and India, the Indus Valley civilization. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, it had structures made mostly of baked uh, uh, brick, which was, I suppose, the material used in the previous cultures as well. And uh, they construct various kinds, constructed various kinds of buildings. Here's a city uh, about uh, oh, 3000 BC, and uh, they had built a structure maybe even prior to the Babylonian civilization, or at least even with the Babylonian civilization in time. And here's a town, the uh, Harappan town. And in the background, you can see a tower. Again, the tower could have been serving as a, an observatory and uh, multi-purpose kind of structure again for, for various kinds of ritualistic celebrations. Next civilization, uh, well, actually, uh, the same civilization as time went on, uh, got involved in uh, recording very precisely the motion of the planets in the sky. That was done accurately by this Indus Valley civilization. Now we have the introduction of the early pyramids in Egypt. And uh, this uh, happened about 5,000 years ago. And the first type of pyramids built were called step pyramids. And if you count the steps, there's seven steps. Again, the idea of representing the uh, visible objects in the sky that were most prominent, sun, moon, and the planets. So this served also as an observatory, while also being a ritualistic kind of a place for celebrating uh, ceremonies and things of that nature. Replaced later in the history of Egypt by pyramids that had smoothed sides. So they plaster their sides to make them smooth so that when they buried their royalty, the king and so forth, they would have a smoother trip to heaven. Would be easier. Notice there's a crown on top of the largest pyramid here, which was the pyramid of Khufu or Cheops. Uh, that was crowned by gold, but the gold since has disappeared, uh, I don't think mysteriously, but by the surrounding uh, people in the countryside making use of it. Now, here's an interesting kind of alignment, and uh, it happens to do with the spring equinox involving the Sphinx and two of the major two of the major temples that are shown here in the in the form of pyramids and what happened in the spring equinox is that the sun would shine and still does on the back of the sphinx illuminating it between these two pyramids now some of the major gods were represented in the constellations in the sky. And here are two of them. One on the left is Isis, 
one on the right is Osiris. And uh, Isis was the wife of Osiris. She put him back together again. His brother got him sliced up somehow or other uh, and had his body parts thrown to various parts of, of the universe. And uh, uh, Isis helped him put him back together again. So she's known as the goddess of reincarnation. Now, as a result of looking at the sky and making heroes and gods and animals in the sky, the Egyptians looked at what we now call Orion on the left image and called that pattern of stars, named it Osiris. And if you look at the belt in Orion, or Osiris in this case, follow it down to the left, you'll come to a bright star, Sirius. There's a star in Canis Major, the brightest star in the winter sky. And uh, Sirius happens to be represented as the goddess Isis, the wife of Osiris in the Egyptian sky. And on the right, you can see the stars themselves greatly magnified, showing the belt of Orion, or Ice, or uh, Osiris, pointing toward his wife, Isis. Now, it's believed that the major large pyramid of Khufu, as it had different kinds of what they thought were ventilation shafts in it, now discover that these ventilation shafts also serve the purpose of aligning with celestial objects in the sky. One shaft aligned with what, that, what at that time was the Egyptian North Star, because the North Star has changed over a period of years. And I'll, I'll speak more about that later. Uh, one shaft pointed to the Egyptian North Star, which was T-H-U-B-A-N, Thuban, in Draco the Dragon. The other shaft pointed to the part of the sky over which the three stars in the belt of Orion passed over, eventually during a certain season, during winter, and also Sirius. So they marked the sky, they knew the season, they used it as a calendar, and also for uh, bearing their dead royalty. Now, here's something interesting. Uh, it's believed by some archaeologists and archaeoastronomers that the belt in Orion, if projected down to the sky, would match up and does match up with the three pyramids on the plateau of Giza. And so it's thought, possibly, that the Egyptians used Osiris, or Orion's, belt to mark the sky where, or mark the ground where they would place the three pyramids. That's quite an interesting kind of a hypothesis, wondering if it's true. Quite interesting. Now the Egyptians also noticed that Mars seemed to move across the sky and other planets, but mostly Mars, in a certain way that formed a kind of a snake-like motion. It moved generally drifting in a westward direction, rather in a, an eastward direction, and then it moved in a westward direction against the background of stars week after week. And this, this snake-like motion was called retrograde, as we now call it, retrograde motion. And at that time, they took notice of that and recorded it. So they spotted this strange motion of Mars in the sky, not knowing what caused it, but they did record it and were aware of it at that time. Now we know it's caused by the Earth and Mars and the other planets going around the Sun in a kind of a racetrack fashion, and the Earth going faster than Mars uh, catches up with it and then passes it and goes around in orbit. And as it does so, as it looks at Mars against the background, it appears that Mars all of a sudden slows up as we catch up to Mars in our racetrack and then seems to stand still as we round the racetrack and we're even with Mars and then uh, moves the other way. 
until Mars catches up. Now, the Chinese had interesting astronomy as well. And uh, they used all those, those celestial objects uh, in the sky to align uh, up with. Uh, and uh, something quite interesting happened, though, in 1054, where they spotted an explosion and creation of a very bright star in the sky that lasted for about 23 days. Very bright. It lasted longer, but it was the brightest for 23 days. Uh, it now is seen in the sky as the Crab Nebula, located in in the a constellation of Taurus the Bull. It's the shoulder of Taurus the Bull. No, I'm sorry, it's not the shoulder, but it is in Taurus the Bull. And uh, it happens to be uh, the remnant of the supernova explosion of that star in 1054, and in the center is the star that exploded. It collapsed into a neutron star. It didn't have enough mass to collapse into a black hole, so there's a neutron star in the center of the Crab Nebula, seen by the ancient people in 1054. The Chinese also made a calendar system marking the months of their year with their constellations. And then we move on to uh, a planetary model that had been made by, by the Islamic group. And uh, you can see that they uh, were very careful in watching and recording the motion of planets in the sky. They also looked very carefully and marked very accurately the phases of the moon. Now, the uh, Arabs also made celestial globes representing the sky. Also made astrolabes to measure the motion of celestial objects very accurately in the sky. Then we move on to South America, to Peru, Machu Picchu. And Machu Picchu was used as a, a retreat for the royalty. It had various kinds of structures organized uh, as places of astronomical alignment. Uh, windows looking out at, at various kinds of structures in the sky, celestial objects in the sky. So it was an area that not only served as a resort, but uh, also served as an observatory in a sense. The Mayans came along, and the Mayans uh, filled in the area in Central America, Mexico. And uh, here's something they constructed called a caracol by the Spanish later on that served as an observatory, the top of which on the left-hand side was an observing a platform looking at the stars and the planets, essentially Venus. Venus was important to the Mayans because it represented a soccer ball that was being uh, played with, kicked around by the children of the gods. So it was a very important kind of a celestial object that was observed carefully. There's a stairway that moves up the caracol, and at various points in the stairway, there are windows where they could observe the Venus as it moved across the sky. And to the right here, you can see a diagram of the area around caracol. Now, also, we find in Machu Picchu, the Pyramid of Kukulcan, one of the major gods of the Mayans. And it's amazing how they were able to construct this pyramid in a sense of making a stairway, as you can see on the left, that uh, played around with sunlight and shadow so that on the equinox, on the equinoxes, a shadow was cast on the stairway, represented a slithering snake 
moving down a stairway because Kukulkan was represented by a feathered serpent. And this snake representing Kukulkan, shadow, moved down a staircase until it came to the bottom where you can see the head of what represents Kukulkan. An amazing kind of uh, architectural sort of accomplishment. The Mayans also had what's known as zenith tubes. I had an opportunity to uh, visit Mexico and one of these areas where they had a zenith tube. They said it was an observatory. And uh, as I went to it, we went underground. Was that an observatory? Well, they thought it was because the tube allowed sunlight to shine through and hit the ground surface at the bottom of the ground below the tube. And it was believed that the way the stones were arranged in the Zenith tube sticking out, it refracted the light, supposedly, so it magnified the image. I never saw that, but that was the claim that was made. So the Mayan had an interesting culture. They also made a calendar, the Mayan calendar. And if you remember in 2012, we're supposed to have the end of the world because the Mayan calendar came to an end. But it was only the end of a cycling series of eras of time. The Aztecs came up with a calendar as well, which was based somewhat on the Mayan calendar. Now, in Wyoming, the Native Americans organized what is now known as the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel was used as a siding device made of stones, organization of what looks like spokes of a wheel representing the, the, the phases of the moon in terms of number of days moon moves from full moon to full moon and at the top of which is a place where they had gone to to uh, meditate so it had a multi-purpose as well had the celebrations there the religious ceremonies and also used for a sighting device for various objects in the sky in a cave Chaco Canyon there's this petrogram and it seems to represent that same supernova that exploded in 1054 <coughs> that was marked by the Chinese astronomers and what seems to be here is the handprint of the artist who drew this a crescent representing the moon supposedly and next to it the supernova that went off with the, the lines coming out of the supernova or the drawing representing the 23 days that the supernova seemed to have lasted in its uh, brilliant form. So this was done by the Native Americans in a cave uh, at, located in Chaco Canyon. And this was, or is right now, the nebula, Crab Nebula, as a result of the expanding gases from the explosion of that supernova. Now, here's another way that they align with various objects in the sky. Here, it happens to deal with the winter solstice, and we're looking at a notch in a series of mountains in the sky. So, natural kinds of, of, of features of the land were used, as well as artificial features, in order to align with various objects in the sky. Another place, Casa Rinconada, and that's also in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. And it's a, a structure called a kiva, which was used for religious ceremonies. But it also marked uh, the idea of the solstice in the sky, the summer solstice, where sunlight shone through one of the openings in the kiva. And as it did so, it shone through an opening on the eastern side of the wall onto the western side, so that it marked a spot representing the 
summer solstice in this kiva amazingly now we have paintings on a wall of a cave in Spain El Castillo that were made as they date back 39,000 BC time and interesting enough they're not only paintings that thought to ordinary represent the idea of magic in the sense of hunting for these animals first of all by painting them on the walls of caves and hunting in the cave itself and then going out to hunt for them and the magic was the connection between hunting them in the cave and hunting them outside the cave but it was discovered recently that these paintings represented constellations in the sky as well as hunting animals and so at that time they were recording location of the sky amazing there are many more of these paintings in different parts of the world and some were even painted by Neanderthals now here in the Nubian desert in Africa south of Egypt there are these standing stones in a circle and uh, it's called it's the desert Stonehenge as a result of that but they're not as high as the stones in Stonehenge they're only about maybe five or six feet high but yet they're good alignment devices and if you look to the right you'll see a circle of stones in the center of which there's three stones and then below that three more stones they believe that those stones represent the belt of Orion it's showing the change in the position of Orion's belt and that means the stars in Orion and it's believed then that this may have been the first recording of the procession of the equinoxes where the earth as it spins as it slows down like a topwood begins to wobble and the axis of the earth points to a different portion of the sky which is why we have different north stars over a period of 26,000 years for one complete cycle moving uh, at the rate of one degree every 27 years but but here they're recording the belt of Orion changing position which more than likely occurred because of the earth's precession they didn't know that the earth was doing this obviously the precession of the earth now did you know there's an American Stonehenge located in Salem New Hampshire if you haven't been there it might be a place to check out but first you can visit it in a vicarious virtual way by going online and looking up America's Stonehenge and you'll find out information about it uh, it uh, is set up to mark the winter solstice there's a stone there that appears to do that and uh, there's a lot of other rocks organized in different ways forming caves uh, an ultra stone supposedly uh, uh, an area a cave behind the some kind of priest would would speak out something while while people were at the ceremony thinking that it came from some god America Stone now it's dated back to being 4,000 years old so there were these people visiting us then coming up with uh, organizing structures of this sort in different parts of New England and here it is in New Hampshire Salem Salem New Hampshire and here's a diagram on the left and right of the organization of America Stonehenge you might want to look at this further and take more time and and uh, uh, figuring out what's located where and so forth by going online and looking up America Stonehenge and that's the end of, of 
the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, happy that you visited us. Please visit us when we open again over at Jenny Jump Observatory, uh, Jenny Jump uh, National Park near Hope, New Jersey. And uh, keep looking up at the sky. Thank you very much, Carl.